and may I request Mr. Mrs. Mukherjee, Tutun Mukherjee to speak. You also prefer to go there? Yeah. Good afternoon. Uh, Professor Amina Kishore, Professor Siddiqali, Professor Mujibuddin, Professor Hoshang Merchant, Dr. Shavgufta Shaheen, my friends and colleagues here. I want to uh, record my deep appreciation for, uh, for giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts on some a subject that is very close to my heart right now. It's not, not just my profession, uh, it's also become my passion. And I, I, I love doing what I am doing, which is uh, promoting comparative literature. And uh, I would like first to respond, our uh, eminent colleagues have raised many, many uh, issues which are at the heart of comparative literature. And I'll try my best to address them and also put forward some, uh, some uh, basic insights, some, some, some basic tools for comparative literatures. And I think of all of you as uh, potential comparatists. So at the end of our discussion, I hope we would have been able to convert many of you to comparative practice. And exactly that is what I want to make a point here. I do not understand why my friends, Professor Siddiqui and Professor Mujibuddin, began by saying that they are not part of comparative literature. I think no Indian should feel that diffidence because we are born into a linguistic diversity. We are born into multiculturalism. We are born into this kind of plurality that are my eminent uh, colleagues have pointed out, which are basic, <coughs> integral to you, uh, the Indian sensibility. So basically, just as comparative literature has implicit comparatism at the heart of multiculturalism, uh, comparative literature is also implicit at the heart of every Indian. And that is our privilege. And uh, that is how we are different. And that is why comparative literature <laughs> is bound to prosper in, uh, in the global south. We no longer uh, talk about uh, third world countries uh, because we have coined. Third world does not mean, it's not a pejorative sense at all. It is uh, just demarcation, categorization of a different kind of an ideological unification of some countries which came together. But we prefer, though we are north of the equator, we prefer to associate ourselves with the global south where there is multiplicity, multiculturalism, plurality, differentiality, similarity, affinities, uh, uh, you know, a, as much as we want them to be. So I want, there are some issues that have been ra raised by my colleagues. For example, the issue of uh, universalism, world literature, the notion of death, etc. Let me take you very quickly back to the genesis of comparative literature. Comparative literature was born in the idea of well, uh, world literature. Goethe's term for it was Weltliteratur, which Rabindranath Tagore uh, sort of uh, transformed and coined as Vishwa Sahitya. Now, these are very, very important junctures of historical time. When Goethe coined this term, you will recall Europe in late 18th century and early 19th century was torn by internecine wars. This was the time to open avenues of exchange, to bring into being a new kind of a cultural togetherness. And this is what Goethe tried to do, that he said, you know, he has never talked at length on well, uh, well literature, very interestingly, Whatever we know, whatever we've gathered about world, world literature and his views on world literature is in the, term, in, in the form of little, little comments that he made to his friends, like sutras, like we have Patanjali's sutras. Mm -hmm. So he has given those sutras, threads, you know, that lead to a lot of discussion. And he said that the time has now come to stop thinking about national literatures. What he meant was there was this kind of, you know, privileging of ethnocentricity in uh, about national literature. Like French would think their literature superior to the British, to the German, to the Russian, etc. So he said, now this is the time to think of world literature. And he made an attempt towards multiculturalism. 
How did he do that? He read some literatures of the Orient, you see? This was the binary of the Occident and the Orient that was being perpetuated at the time. And he said that, let me read the literature of the other. This is a word that has come up also in the discussion of, my, uh, of uh, uh, those who have spoken before. And he said, let me read, for example, the literature of those countries which are peripheral to Europe. And he read novels from China. He read poetry from Iran and he fell love, in love with them. And he discovered the Chinese novel to be a prototype of the European novel. And he, he talked about it. And then he translated Hafez. He fell in love with Hafez's poetry. And so much so that he transcreated Hafez's poetry, not in a hegemonic, not in a, a patronizing manner, uh, in the way Fitzgerald translated Omar Khayyam. He, Goethe tried to uh, uh, bring a kind of a, uh, a egalitarian kind of a translation, which is very post-colonial in its concept of having a kind of a, a parity in the, between the target and the source text. So what he was trying to do was to bring into discussion literatures that were peripheral to Europe. But whenever he was making judgmental statements about these literatures, no matter how sympathetic he was to these literatures, his was what, is, what we now call privileged ethnocentrism. What is privileged ethnocentrism? The yardstick of judgment remained Western paradigm, Western aesthetics. So he was looking at what was the other, what was the peripheral. He translated, you know, Hafez as the West and Eastern West and Eastern Divan. And here he was talking about the poetry in a very sympathetic manner, but whenever he was making uh, judgments or comments on terms, in terms of aesthetics, they were ethnocentric, trying to privilege the Western standards of aesthetic understanding. So what I want you to remember is the historical context when Goethe was talking about world literature this was 1831, and he was talking about, I'm sorry, 1829, 31st January, when he was really, when he coined the term, wealth literature. But this, he was not the originary, you know, we have effaced the concept of ori origins, but people had been thinking about this much before. Goethe articulated the idea. It was in the air. So comparative literature as an idea was in the air, because when you are talking about world literature, and in practical terms, even now we are talking about world literature. I just attended a wonderful seminar at Harvard University where our friend David Damrosh, who is talking about world literature all over again in the 21st century. But when you talk about world literature, which is a concept of universalism, you, uh, you encounter certain problems. Problems of in practical terms. How do you access world literature? How do you access? I want to read, for example, literature from Russia. If I don't know the language, how will I access it? I want to read something from Hawaii or something from Philippines and beautiful poetry from Vietnam, for example. How do I read it? Unless I don't, don't know the, I, unless I know the language. So in practical terms, it's very good to talk about well literature, but in practical terms, you have encountered a serious problem. So comparative literature emerged out of this thinking about well literature. And comparative literature emerged as a method. So whenever we are talking about comparative literature, different cultures, from different literatures, different languages. So when uh, comparative literature moved from Europe to America, it was a similar historical situation of disturbance and uh, a kind of a, uh, a kind of a turmoil. And I'm talking about the second after the Second World War, when the Cold War had uh, already emerged as a you know kind of a tension creating atmosphere. So after the Second World War, the European comparative literature moved to America, and here was the birth of. Uh, a birth of multiculturalism. Remember, America's uh, domestic policy 
very often is, you know, in response to, uh, I'm sorry, whatever their policies are, domestic policies are always in response to the needs of the time. So the need of the time in America when multiculturalism was born was the need to cement the different ethnic presences that, ha that, had, uh, that had come into the American society. So it was a time to try to create uh, avenues of cultural exchange. And it was thought that comparative literature would be the ideal avenue to cement this kind of a multicultural composition of the American society. Comparative literature needed to address the demands of the American society of that point of time. And therefore, multiculturalism and comparative literature, was tr uh, it was decided to bring them together. Multiculturalism is not comparative literature. Cultural studies is not comparative literature. Comparative literature is a method that might, you know, be used for by multiculturalists, might become useful for cultural studies, but comparative literature is a separate discipline of its own. And the comparative literature has at its heart literature, remember? And then it has extended, extended its boundaries to accommodate multicultural texts of multicultural uh, uh, emergence of different sources. It has extended itself to accommodate cultural studies also as a methodology. But comparative literature, its basis lies in literature and in languages. And as I said, that this is uh, the basis of comparative literature, that it is born out of linguistic diversity. Now, to quickly address some of the issues raised here, Professor Siddiq Ali talked about, and also Professor Mujibuddin mentioned the death of a discipline, the book written by Gayatri Chakravarti Spivak, right? In 1993, after the emergence of multiculturalism, I'll try to tell you how multi, uh, comparative literature is different from multiculturalism, how it is different from cultural studies. So for that, I need you to, uh, to uh, think of a date, uh, 1923, when globalization has come into being, when multiculturalism is at its height, as it were, in America and was, uh, it was disseminated around the world as a kind of, uh, kind of an ethos, kind of an ambience that would be very uh, uh, congenial to the discussion of literatures and texts of the world. In 1993, Susan Bassnett uh, talked about death of comparative literature. This call, this, uh, this uh, uh, voice was this anxiety. You know, comparative literature has always been overshadowed by this sense of anxiety and crisis. What is the anxiety? That comparative literature must address the needs of the time. The crisis is, how should the discipline be, would change, would accommodate itself to answer these needs of the time? So in 1993, Susan Bassnett's call that Comparative literature is dead. And in, in 2003, Gayatri Chakravarti, both, both are comparis, comparatives, by the way. Gayatri Spivak's book, which is actually a publication of the three essays that she had delivered earlier, Death of a Discipline. What is the death that they are talking about? Comparative literature has in it a desire to die, to be reborn, to be reinvented, to be transformed to uh, uh, rekindle its spirits every time. This is something that is integral to comparative literature. No other discipline conducts itself every, t three year, uh, every 10 years uh, to a, a, a sense of a reflexivity. There is held every 10 years Association of American you know, Comparative Literature Society, a kind of uh, self-reflection -reflex an introspective practice which tries to address the challenges of the time and how comparative literature must change itself, must address the challenges of the time. So comparative literature dies every 10 years and comparative literature is reborn every 10 years. It's like a phoenix, you know. <laughs>
it rises from its ashes. And this is the desire to die that is absolutely integral to the spirit of comparative literature. This de desire to die means that it will be reborn again. So uh, Spivak actually says death of a discipline or, you know, death of a, a, a discipline has to die. The way, that means the way it was practiced has to die. And the new practice has to emerge. And uh, uh, Spivak uh, 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 said that the new practice would be comparative literature in a new avatar. Now it had moved from Europe to America and now it must move to the global south. And comparative literature, compa uh, Gatri Spivak believed, will thrive in the global south. And she said, this is the wake of globalization. And she said, globalization is a very loaded term. It is a very uh, materialistic term. It's an imperial term. It's, very, it's already burdened. So let us not talk about globalization. Let us talk about the sense and sensitivity to the planet. And in that book, she offered a new term. She said, planetarity. Let us now think about comparative literature in, in terms of the planet. And the planet which will be embracing, all embracing. It will embrace the entire world. And we, have, we, we shall have to think about new method. Remember, comparative literature is a method of study. So you must think of a new method that will em encompass planetarity, which will have this kind of a sympathy, uh, a, a kind of an ecological sense of embracing the entire planet. And then we, the comparatists, have been talking about different kinds of methods that can be brought in uh, to study comparative literature. Multiculturalism may be a dimension of comparative literature. Cultural studies may be a dime. Remember, cultural studies also has its own ideological uh, tool, its own toolbox. You see, cultural studies that grew in the University of Birmingham, it has its own toolbox. So one can appropriate that toolbox to a certain extent. One can appropriate multiculturalism to a certain extent. Basic to comparative literature is its privileging of languages. Multiculturalism does not privilege language. It can be accessed in English. So comparative literature basis is linguistic uh, 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 diversity, plurality of cultures. So it can extend to embrace multiculturalism. And multiculturalism will benefit from appropriating from associate itself, uh, associating itself with comparative literature. But comparative literature is different. <coughs> because it, is, it goes that, that step forward in making plurality, in making linguistic diversity, making its cultural, uh, uh, you know, uh, excess the basis of, basis of the discipline. So uh, this is comparative literature, and this is how comparative literature is a part of multiculturalism, is different from multiculturalism. Uh, comparative literature is a part of cultural studies, is different from cultural studies, and it, it insists upon egalitarianism of languages. I talked about privileged ethnocentrism of Goethe. Now, when, when we have come to the global south, among the nations which got independence in the 20th century, we are talking about nations which are brought together into a new kind of uh, comradeship. I'll not say brotherhood comradeship, and it's a kind of an exchange of ideas that has to happen on an egalitarian basis. Because though it's a debated term, post-colonialism, nevertheless, it is there. These are the societies that were previously colonies, and we have many things to share. But the best thing that we have among us is egalitarianism, the spirit of egalitarianism. And comparative literature, holds the flag for that. Thank you very much.